Good morning. And thank you all for joining us for our very first State of the Public Narrative Address. I'm Jamira Alexander, a South Shore resident. And today I'm not the president nor the executive director of this great organization. I'm simply a leader here to share some amazing stories with you. Stories that will you know, remind you of stories you've heard throughout the community in these last 12 months and stories that may even tug on your heart a little bit. Me, myself, I'm a crier. I have my Kleenex nearby. Um, you know, leading an organization that focuses on stories and has done so for the last 32 years comes with a huge responsibility, a huge accountability even to the communities that we serve. And I don't take for granted how often people trust us with their stories and their experiences real life situations that they're living through, that they are processing with their families and their children, and really trying to grapple and understand the world around them. And public narrative has been there. Throughout the years, several leaders, we've been here. We've been here right in lockstep with community leaders and journalists and helping them to tell the story. But the last 12 months have been unimaginable. You know, I. I, they really leave me speechless simply because <clears throat> all the experiences that people have shared with me, you know, come from folks who are very well connected to the organization, who, you know, the people that they serve, they have close ties to, close relationship with. And the last 12 months have really opened my eyes to how important that connection is, that we maintain that connection. Now, not only am I a crier, I'm also a hugger. And to not be able to hug the people that I work with, my family members, it's, it's really been really been a little devastating. It's that comfort that we need from one another that we only get in close proximity. So while I'm grateful for technology and I'm grateful for the virtual space that we get a chance to connect and whatnot, it's still not the same as putting your arms around someone. So, before I even start to cry now, just in thinking about um, the, you know, the lives that we've lost in the last 12 months, um, a lot of what we've seen in our country in the last 12 months and how ever present our realities are, no matter how distant we've been from our realities or how much more connected we've become to our realities, they are still very much so our realities as people of color, as women, as leaders, as, as friends and family, our stories are so needed at this time in order to put the pieces back together again. So I asked several leaders, community leaders, community folks, students, educators, I asked folks to share their stories. And for all the stories we got in, some incredible stories of folks sharing their experiences the last 12 months, we've selected a few to share with you today and invite you to share your story even as the event is taking place. Over a year ago, I had the privilege of meeting Jamira Alexander and working with her. I am an instructor, a professor at UIC. Jamira was willing to be a student for a while and thinking out narrative change in our city of Chicago and how to actually understand the impact that storytelling and tracking of people's stories and eliciting the person who is typically not talked to and listened to their story. I work with a lot of students and I have the privilege of being with them as they have aha moments. COVID-19, George Floyd's murder, the craziness of the antics of the past president in this country, the polarization of our conversations, the state of our narrative in the city of Chicago, I think in the middle of just unbelievable cacophony, I think is a hopeful one. Because in order to actually get better, in order to actually transform, we have to get really, really messy. And that's what I think has happened and we are living through it, and we are finding one another in order to talk about it. So that's my experience so far of the last 12 months. 
You know, I'm really grateful for um, Anna Lloyd. She made mention of the time that we worked together when I was a student in one of her classes. And coming into public narrative, I had all sorts of ideas of how to make this organization work for people. And, but I did not have the clarity in how to carry that out. And that's something that her class offered me in being able to develop this narrative change model that would allow us to leverage the stories and the relationships that we had here at this great organization. She made mention of George Floyd's murder. And I remember following his murder, I just remember feeling so enraged and just kind of like knowing that these feelings had to go somewhere. And what would I do with those feelings? What would I do with um, what I knew of this country? What would I do with the access and the authority that I have? And this narrative change model just simply opened the door to look at how do we not miss a moment? How do we not miss an opportunity to truly change things in America? Time and again, we've seen movement spark and we've seen protests and we've seen all these things that over time, they just kind of subside. But I was really intentional, especially in, in connecting with several of the folks that I'm gonna talk about next in doing my best in making certain that whatever public narrative contributed to this moment would not fall on deaf ears and that it would be, not be lost in, in, the, in the halls of history, you know, and in connecting with now, of course, we were all forced to quarantine nearly a year ago. And, you know, we had a, very, a fairly small team at the time. Uh, we were in the process of uh, developing our board of directors. And I can say that most of our team, directors included, have never met each other in person. And to know that these people come to us with the experience, with the interest, the curiosity, but even more so the passion to then contribute whatever they can contribute to the public narrative is just incredible to me. They come from all different places across the city. And as you, you will find today is not necessarily about our titles, but today is more so about the role that we play in society and how we've each chosen to leverage that access that authority. And I'm really grateful for our team in, in, in the sense of when we come together, we have very transparent dialogues. You know, we have, we have the kind of conversations that allow us to talk about race, allow us to talk about, though we are a, a nonpartisan organization, allow us to talk about the impact of politics and allow us to really talk about how do we, you know, sustain some sort of impact for people. And I love that you know, we have the chemistry that we have, that it allows us to tap into deep issues. It allows us to not only be deep thinkers, but it allows us to be deep doers, you know, and there's a lot of conversations that are happening right now. We wonder, you know, where's this information going? What, what, are, what are people going to do with what they know? You know, there is no, there is no, no longer can folks say, well, I didn't know that this was going on in this community. I didn't know this was going on in this city or in this area. In all actuality, we know the history of where we live. We know the history of our communities. We know the history of our country. Now is the time for action. And what might we do with that action? What might we do with that authority? So I'm really grateful for the folks that we get a chance to work with, not only within our immediate team or our board directors, but even our project partners. And some of the issues that they've brought to us and brought to our attention they've really caused us to really dig deeper and look at how are we actually changing the public narrative around public safety, health, and education. And you would say, you would really think like, you know, why set such lofty goals? You know, I'm, I'm realistic in the, in the idea that a lot of what we set out to do, there's a chance we may not see the, the total manifestation of it in our lifetime, but, I believe that's what the pioneers before us, that was a chance and the risk that they were real willing to take. And so I'm very grateful for the folks that serve alongside us and, and welcome the thoughts and ideas that we have for processing and helping to change these types of narratives. Project partners to include Chris Goins and Thrive Chicago with the My Brothers Keeper Alliance, 
I'm so grateful for that project. It helps us look at how we're changing narratives for boys and young men of color. And the conversations that we've had with the Narrative Change Committee have allowed us to really have, to go beyond the surface. So we know that, you know, black men and boys are oftentimes stereotyped and, you know, the life expectancy rate are not where they, rates are not where they should be for boys and young men of color, uh, let alone, you know, the school to prison pipeline that oftentimes is, is set up for them to ultimately fail. And so what I'm, what I'm so grateful for in that project is that Chris and his team are very intentional at how they look at, you know, changing that narrative as it relates to establishing more male educators. And it started, that, that vision I'm sure started of course with Chris as a male educator, but in addition to that is expanding. And the, the narrative change committee is really activated around how do we call attention to the issues that matter to us? And we really call upon philanthropy to support those causes. And I'm so grateful for the support that we have through the Chicago Community Trust for that project. And that we're able to then look at how can we invite media partners to the table to help with the, help to change those narratives and help to change the way that you know people view boys and young men of color, but even more importantly, to help it, to help uplift or even expand upon the way that boys and young men of color see themselves, but are oftentimes you know a little shy to share because of the need to survive. So I'm really, really excited about the work that Chris and his team are doing and just honored to be a part of that action team. You can visit uh, MBK Chicago on Facebook as well as Instagram to keep up with all that's going on uh, within the action team, within the Alliance. My name is Curtis Lawrence. I'm an associate professor of journalism at Columbia College Chicago. I wanna thank Jamira for inviting me to share my reflections of the last year. Wow, it's been some year. Um, I'll go back to it's been in a, in a few months. It'll be a year since the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. I remember that weekend um, watching the protests here in Chicago. For me, um, my first thoughts were of my nephew, like many of us who have who are parents or who have nieces and nephews. We thought, where are our children? Are they out there? Are they involved? Um, Two of my great nephews are in their late teens. Um, and I wondered, you know, were they out there? And um, one of my nephews wanted to be there, but um, couldn't, couldn't get downtown, which I was a little um, uh, gratified that I didn't have to worry about him. But, but, but what happened um, sparked a, a conversation with us and we talked a lot about his feelings, his thoughts. He shared a lot of things he had not previously shared with me. So it, it, it helped us open a new dialogue. Um, he talked about his, his um, aspirations to be an activist himself. And um, we still talk about that now and then. So it opened some doors and hopefully it did that for a lot of people. Overall, um, the events of the past year have made me very proud of young people, how they stepped up and, um, and, and, and met the many challenges in front of us. And so I hope that will continue in the years to come and that um, those of us who are a little older will give them, the young people all the support they need. So grateful for Curtis. Um, when we were housed at Columbia College, Curtis was a really really great supporter of public narrative. Um, and, and I don't know how much you all know or don't know about the organization, but the pandemic really led us to leave our, our uh, office space at Columbia College after 27 years. And you can imagine what, a, um, what an experience that was in the middle of a pandemic trying to you know, relocate a, a whole office. So we've been working remote you know, since, um, the, since the quarantine and um, have plans to do so, you know, indefinitely, as I'm sure many folks do. And as you probably have seen, you know, in a lot of different articles you've seen, perhaps even on the news, you know, talks about what the office space looks like. What is the traditional office space? You know, is that like done away with? You know, we really don't know. I, but I can tell you that the priority right now, and I think it's top of mind for everyone is simply survival. 
and making certain that we are able to live beyond this experience and live to tell our stories um, even after you know the, the um, pandemic is over. I, I would really hope, and I, I learned this through, last year we had a series of listening sessions with folks and we partnered with the organization called Local Voices Network in delivering some of these listening sessions. And in one of the listening sessions, the COVID-19 and democracy, there was a group that talked a little bit about how, you know, you don't want to waste, of course, you, you never want to waste a, uh, a good crisis. You want to come out better than before. And the possibilities of that are certainly there. But I think it comes, of course, with having the tools to be able to do so, you know, and it, it comes with having the support to be able to do so. And oftentimes we, we've heard time and again where there's just not enough support, there's just not enough uh, resources to really help people sustain during this time. You know, there's so much pressure on essential workers. There's so much pressure on educators and students doing remote learning. And the challenges that come with that are astronomical. But as, as much as we are impacted by what's going on, Journalists are impacted just the same, if not more. Their jobs being to tell the story of what's going on, yet they can't always get to what's going on. You know, and, and the tone that is now set in this country that you don't quite know what you're reading, you don't quite know what, what information you're being fed, you know, and, and even factual information, it, depending on whether or not we want to accept it and receive it, could be read as fake news. And so it's important that we are able to really identify what is misinformation or disinformation. But in all actuality, <clears throat> excuse me, in all actuality, you know, what information are we needing to tap into more than ever? So I'm really inspired by the journalists who kept going, who kept pushing, who came with beautiful stories, beautiful, you know, packages and, and, and projects and things that gave us insight to what was happening on the streets. You know, Southside Weekly, The Tribe, Chicago Reader, Injustice Watch, they've done incredible jobs in really keeping us connected. And it's those community and ethnic media outlets who need our support more than ever right now. As newsrooms downsize, as traditional outlets downsize and they begin to shift, it's so important that we stay connected to what's going on and, and are able to see the strength of our democracy in media. All right, so I want you all to visit a website, savechicagomedia.org. The Chicago Independent Media Alliance is one that has done some really incredible work in gathering Chicago's independent media and in, in gathering those outlets and being able to provide resources to those outlets. It's just been, it's been um, not only innovative, but it really sets the tone for how we're able to change the narrative here in Chicago and how it's going to take media and community doing it together. Listen, 2020 was crazy. I lived in three states. The university where I taught shut down and then I absconded to Michigan to post up at my mama's house so I could meet my deadlines because all it was was deadline after deadline after deadline. I had a book due, I had a chapter in a book due, I had a cover story due, everything was due. Finally, I actually had to quit one of my three and a half jobs. Finally, I made myself back to Safe Haven in Chicago, back to my lovely loft in downtown Chicago, and things still didn't get normal. <laughs> I don't have anything more to say. I'm just trying to work on balancing it all. I'm trying to learn the meaning of the word no, but we'll see how that goes. Deborah Douglas is one of my favorite journalists um, and the, the passion that she has and the social justice work that she does and, and the way she approaches, I should say, social justice in her writing is just incredible. <clears throat> Curtis made mention of uh, being proud of young people during this time. And Deborah recently put out a book um, it's US Civil Rights, the US Civil Rights Trail. Um, I'll include a link to it, but what I'm so encouraged by, and, and there was some work that we did over the summer with the Chicago Police Department's Youth District Advisory Council. And the YDAC, they spent time really looking at, like in real time, what was going on around the city over the summer and what they could do about it. And the mind maps and the, and the uh, ideas that they had 
which just were really, really incredible that I want to read one of the experiences from the young people um, who, you know, participated in the program, of course, but is even, even the more impacted by um, the pandemic. And this is from Itzuri Kano from CPD's YDAC. And this pandemic has impacted everyone in various yet somewhat similar ways. She says she's a very hands-on and in-person learner, therefore having to, Zoom, to do Zoom meetings instead of meeting all together in a room has been difficult for her, as I'm sure it has been for a lot of people. She does not concentrate nor interact as much as she does in person. And, and she says she would rather be in a room full of people, discuss issues and find solutions, write them on a blank sheet of paper, tape them on a wall, and discuss our work as a group. This pandemic, this pandemic and social distancing has definitely changed many things this past year, but her hope, but she's hopeful and ready to get back to the old way of doing things, as I'm sure many folks are. And I, I love how, I love the imagery and how, you know, little things that we once took for granted and being able to like tape our pieces of paper and our thoughts and ideas um, in, in the space and really share and reflect out. So young people have really brought a lot of perspective to the work that we're doing presently as we look at narratives that impact public safety. And rather than suggest, oh, well, you're 17, you know, how much do you know about this stuff? Rather than suggest that they indeed have a perspective and they have an insight that, you know, we have to honor. And we have to honor by listening to their experiences and allowing their voices to be heard. And then also following through with very meaningful action. And I'm very, very, very grateful for those young folks who have represented Chicago in different stages, different places, different platforms. One in particular with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. As easy as it is to believe that a lot of what we're fighting for, a lot of what we're pushing for is falling on deaf ears. There are moments where I have to say, I'm very optimistic that people are listening and they're looking for how they can leverage their power and authority to make good of some of those um, concerns. And through the International Association of Chiefs of Police, we had an opportunity to participate in a breakthrough collaborative series with Georgetown University, where they looked at a framework that they have for transforming the juvenile justice system. Now, the framework is not made, it is not available to the public just yet, but the thing that I loved about the framework was that it was not the, you know, the titles, if you will, who were weighing in on it. It was the community they were allowing to weigh in, in on it. And in that weigh-in, there were several words that, you know, community agreed needed to change. And not so much of focusing on how we empower community, but focusing on how we invest in community that we can help to sustain community. And to, to ultimately have the hope that not only might these words be matched with meaningful action and ultimately be matched with the finances to support the ideas, the, the mere fact that this university was going in this direction to really like lift that up through this project was one that really left me optimistic and really hopeful for what that might mean for what we are able to do here in, here in Chicago even. And so it's been the Youth District Advisory Council that has really opened our eyes to how we look at community engagement, how we look at community policing. A lot of people think that, you know, oh, we want more community policing. But in all actuality, and I, I learned this even in working with the YDAC, the community policing is not what we want. We don't want more community policing. More community policing means that there's more police in our communities, as opposed to there being resources and access given and opportunities given to help prevent their, prevent the need for more community policing. And so being able to um, redefine a lot of that language and being able to understand that language on a different level has really been meaningful for that experience with the young people and how they're able to represent Chicago among the International Association of Chiefs of Police and other groups that they're invited to work with. Now, some people know me, you know, uh, prior to public narrative, others maybe not. I get a lot of questions like, what do you do? What is it that you do? 
I'm very much so rooted to community in the sense of if there's a, a community project that really, you know, is focused on the things that I'm most passionate about, um, I am so eager to be a part of it. And I'm so eager to see how we can leverage it, scale it and do more of it. And so this next video I'm going to share comes from a woman who I've done, you know, several projects with. Um, but the passion that you know, is found in the work that we do together is a testament to what sound partnership is. You know, not, not, notwithstanding that we may not always agree. We may not always understand each other, but we have the compassion, we have the patience to love each other through dif difficult experiences for the betterment of our communities. And at this moment in time, I think it's more obvious than not that that's exactly what we need as we go forward. The past 12 months, 2020 was uh, re-traumatizing for me. Uh, what it reminded me of was when I went through my cancer journey uh, over a decade ago and, um, you know, trying to figure out what's wrong, finally getting a diagnosis, uh, and then trying to understand your treatment plan. And all the while, do you think you're going to die? Um, that I, I saw that on a, on a scale that humanity was going through. So I was reliving my personal experience, but watching humanity go through it. And that was hard. <laughs> that was, that was really hard, you know? So the, the little things of people trying to, you know, keep business going as usual, or, you know, I gotta, I gotta, you know, work and still do everything that I have to do. And, you know, still pushing and pushing and pushing. I couldn't understand. And I, I wanted to tell people just relax. This is the time to reset ourselves. This is the time to reevaluate and, and see how we're supposed to do things differently or else death is inevitable. Um, and, and, you know, just as cancer cells were, were killing off parts of my body, that's how I feel the pandemic was with parts of our neighbors, neighborhood and parts of Chicago, parts of the nation, parts of the world, you know, it was, it was slowly killing off part of our human body. And, um, and so I had to, you know, just ask the same questions I did before of, you know, I, um, what's the point of this and what am I supposed to be doing? And I, I will hope that, you know, we come away asking ourselves that same question, you know, what am I supposed to be doing? And I, I, I personally can really relate to having moments of really feeling helpless. Like, what am I supposed to do today? You know? Um, and it's something about really having a heart for humanity and really being interested in, you know, making the world better, the world around you so much better than when you found it. And ultimately, I think that's, that's really the reason why we're here, you know, not just here today, but in our respective uh, silos in, in an effort to make it better, you know, and make it better for the people around us. You know, another uh, of our community partners, um, she wrote in, she said, her name is Linda Gordon. She said, the last 12 months has been an era that I have never experienced in life before. The uncertainty of it all, this life-threatening virus called COVID threw us all for a loop. Not knowing if myself or my family members will be that person to contract the virus and actually live. Not knowing if there would be a vaccine, so much uncertainty. Through it all, having to manage my day-to-day -day duties as a parent, helping my daughter navigate through online courses, also while, she, while she's helping her professor navigate, I tell you the digital divide is real. Through it all, I still try to maintain a peace of mind. However, with all the racism and injustices going on in the world and around me, started to take a toll on me mentally. Dealing with my own injustices at work while all this was going on, had me mentally exhausted and then being laid off took the cake. Through it all, these 12 months has shown me how to cherish my loved ones more, how to be innovative, tap into myself and skills and show me how resilient I am. 
And I love, you know, of course, the transparency that everyone has shared and sharing their experiences and their stories. But to be as vulnerable as we've been forced to be, and then to find comfort in being vulnerable among each other, I, I, I you know, I, I see that really as one of the perks of this, you know, all uncertain experience. You know, when I when I first came to public narrative, I knew that I needed to find a therapist. Now you might say, like, you know, what does getting a new job mean for finding a therapist? It meant everything. Um, I had had experiences where I didn't always handle them, handle them in the best way. You know, too much pressure, and I found that you know it, it just I kind of crumbled under it. And so I knew that if I were to make good of this opportunity, I was going to have to have someone that I could talk to and share various experiences with so as not to crumble under the pressure. And that's when I connected with my first therapist. Um, she was one who allowed me, my therapy sessions were only like 50 minutes long. And she was one who allowed me to come in and spend the first 20 minutes going off about whatever it was that was going on in my life at the time. And after the first 20 minutes, she would say, okay, well, you obviously can't say any of that. And she would help me find a new perspective. And so I love how Linda shared that about how mentally challenging this experience has been because it's in those mentally challenging moments that we have to find new perspective. And it's not easy to do, you know, people, people find perspective and they find comfort in different things, but to find perspective is different for all of us. You know, some find perspective in vices, others find perspective in relationships, and some find perspective in faith, in their faith. And to be able to find perspective and lean on it and, and be enriched by it is really what I think a lot of us are looking for when it comes to finding stability during this time. And while I know it, it, there's, again, there's so much that is uncertain, even as we explore, you know, this vaccine, you know, and we grapple with the way that Black people have been treated in this country, and particularly as it relates to the medical industry, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we make a decision, you know? And then some, some people are even at the place where they're like, nope, no way, no vaccine, you know? Um, I'm reminded that, and I, I really have learned this through our health project with Northwestern. We're working with a group, the Alliance for Research in Chicagoland Communities. And I absolutely positively love this group, but I also love all that I've learned through this group. And the thing that was, was first most alarming to me was that even after research has taken years to complete, it still takes 17 years to reach communities. And so I remember going to one of our task force members, um, Phyllis Rogers. She's the leader of an organization called uh, Peer Plus Educate, uh, Training and Associates, or oh, Mentoring and Associates, I'm sorry. And um, Phyllis, they hosted an expo, a health expo. And I remember there being a gentleman in the audience who after hearing the panel share, he commented about his mom who had, who had passed away um, from an illness that, you know, had he had information or had they had information about the clinical trials surrounding the illness, that there might be a chance that she would still be alive. And of all that I had seen that day, his story was one that really sat with me. And, and so when I think about, you know, how we grapple with the history of Black folks and, and healthcare in this country, how we grapple with the need for health equity, you know, and then a lot of the uh, vaccine distribution plans that I'm, that I'm learning about, it's like, what do you do? You know, you can't become paralyzed simply in not making a decision, but what do you do, you know, outside of educate yourself? You know, I think about the folks who have lost their lives to COVID and, you know, had they had an opportunity to take a vaccine, would they had? And so there's a lot to really wrestle with. And I, and I have to be honest, I have not reached a decision just yet. You know, I think it's so important to simply educate oneself. And 
to, to be able to weigh the, um, the impact of taking a vaccine or the impact of not taking a vaccine. And I have a lot of folks like on my Facebook timeline, a lot of people that I know who have gotten it and oh, I feel fine and my arm is a little sore after, you know, and I have to be honest, it's, it's their stories and their experiences that are, are helping me to educate myself and make a decision. But to simply flat out say, no, I'm not gonna do it. I don't think we have that option right now. I don't think that we have that, um, I don't think that we can so quickly say that and still fight for health equity. So I think it's, 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 it's something to weigh and something to consider and certainly really, you know, think about how we're able to, you know, educate ourselves and, and, and identify with uh, different information. You know, a lot of, I may mention of community and ethnic media outlets who are very much so, um, you know, focused on getting information to folks in the community, but also leveraging the stories of folks in the community. And so in really focusing on, focusing on that, I think we have to, you know, be realistic with ourselves about the impact that whether we decide to take a vaccine or not, the impact that that may have on the folks around us. Hi, I'm Sharif Walker in the Austin community in Chicago. And uh, wow, the last 12 months for me. So it's come with a lot of change, even uh, considering the climate, a political climate in this country, considering COVID, but also considering I went through a professional change, having been in an organization for 17 years, uh, find myself doing some consulting work at the beginning of last year and then moving into a new role as CEO uh, at Bethel New Life in Austin on the West Side. And uh, that's a challenge within itself during COVID, not being able to have face-to-face -face meetings with uh, stakeholders and sit down with people and let people feel how genuine you are towards the passion and mission of an organization, uh, especially in your first time uh, serving in a CEO position has been challenging. But of course, with all of the virtual meetings and getting used to virtual space, we've made those adjustments. But personally, uh, you know, I had an 18 year old daughter that graduated high school through COVID. So not being able to interact in ways traditionally, we, we know we support our young people uh, through celebrating uh, um, opportunities to uh, succeed and move on into uh, next stages of life. And then um, my wife and I, we also live in an intergenerational house where my parents are here, you know, um, in their uh, early 70s, but really trying to adjust to being at home every day and not being able to get outside and enjoy uh, getting fresh air like uh, we usually would. So we've gotten through the challenges. Things are going OK. Um, looking for the end of this uh, isolation, though. I'm really grateful for Sharif. Sharif um, worked with us last year when we uh, had our listening sessions. We got a chance to work together again uh, during the city's Together We Heal initiative with Candace Moore in the, in the equity office. And the, this experience, it feels like it's just everything happening at one time. And I, I, I don't know about anyone else, but you know, to watch the news and to see it all play out, it's like, what more can we really add to the mix? But I think this is a time that allows us to really, again, educate ourselves, yes, but also connect in a way that is meaningful, in a way that is thoughtful and compassionate and considerate. The um, Equity Office hosted a uh, Together We Heal virtual summit. And what was really cool about the summit, you know, they, there was, of course, this um, open forum that we could connect with folks and have conversation and dialogue. But then there were one-on-one -on -one conversations we could have with folks. And one of the women that I connected with was Ursula Gruber of Rogers Park. And she shared her story to say that the last 12 months have reinforced the power and fragility of shared truths. My life began to separate into three di distinct arenas last spring, separated by a cognitive dissonance bolstered by inequity. Last March, my colleagues in the high school debate world began putting together the infrastructure for what we, for what we knew would be at least a year of virtual tournaments. 
We have tried our best to make things as accessible as possible, but the digital divide is hard to break at the best times. My neighborhood has been hard hit by COVID and violence in the last few years, but through efforts to help each other and make food resources available or accessible to others, we have grown community connections that we didn't know we were missing. Rogers Park is a series of small communities with overlapping boundaries and shared spaces. We are working towards more accountability to and recognition of the different groups that make up our neighborhood. At the same time, the suburban school district that employs me has disregarded warnings about the dangers and inequity of hybrid learning and prioritized the purchase of expensive projectors, cameras, and cameras over more robust professional development on how to make remote learning engaging and relevant. There has been no discussion at all on how our practices affect the communities around us. The cognitive dissonance has made everything harder. Without a shared understanding of who we are and what is happening, it is difficult to make any progress. And I think I, I'm, I'm so grateful that Ursula shared her experience. I think that um, I've seen several posts, I should say, about, you know, don't overwhelm, you know, the black people in your life and making them relive traumatic experiences and, you know, looking to black people to educate you in ways that you can educate yourself. And I'm grateful that, you know, she made mention of, of, of course, cognitive dissonance, you know, in, in the willfulness to ignore what is so blatant and what is so, you know, ever present. And to know that there are folks who, you know, very much so are educating themselves and really looking to see what they can do to help change things. And just quite frankly, how they can use, how, how they can leverage their white privilege, right? Like to know that there are those folks out there and that, you know, in many instances we're connected to them, but we only know how connected we are through and by conversation with each other and what we are, will, what we are willing and able to challenge each other, you know, to. And the thing that I love about all three of the projects I've made mention of, the public education, the public safety, the public health projects, is that we get to have those hard conversations among each other. And not, I mean, at, at no time, point in time, we meet, we usually meet weekly. For the most part, we meet weekly. And at no point in time do I ever feel like we are just simply rambling or, uh, or complaining, you know, about what we're experiencing. We're finding ways to have grace. We're finding ways to be compassionate. And even more so, we're finding ways to forgive. We're finding ways to forgive, you know, systems and people and, and decisions that have been made on our behalf, you know, unbeknownst to us that we are ultimately impacted by. And none of that is easy, but the thing that I've learned and have really come to treasure about forgiveness. And I'm sure you all have heard this, like forgiveness is not for the other person, it's for us. The thing that is so powerful though about forgiveness is it has this ability to set your heart free in a way that you may not even know that your heart was bound. And I've had circumstances to happen that if I had taken on the circumstance itself and not exercise forgiveness, I, there would be a version of me that I wouldn't even recognize, let alone love. And so I, I got a chance to really experience it and quite frankly, on a regular basis, how to exercise forgiveness in a way that liberates, in a way that helps to sustain and just produces life. And I may mention earlier of the International Association of Chiefs of Police in 2018, no, in 2019, um, I was invited to attend uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, their safety and justice conference in DC. And um, one of the officers, Officer Vanessa Wesley, who of course is recently retired, but at the time um, she invited me to attend on behalf of Chicago. The way that the conference was set up, you had um, superintendents, you had uh, police chiefs, you had community partners who who attended, you know, alongside those uh, leaders, and so that invitation was very special. 
Um, we spent about three days there. And oh, during the first day, they had us go to the uh, African-American Smithsonian um, Museum. And that was such an experience. Now I'm one who loves information. And I just remember walking the halls of that museum, fascinated by what I was seeing. Some of what I had learned in school, much of what you know, I knew a little bit about, but not as much as what the museum, not as much detail as the museum went into. And so I remember feeling like just betrayed almost in the sense of not so much even of our history and what has happened in our history, but more so of the fact that here I am to be educated and I'm not taught what I need to know in order to survive this life. And, um, and I'm not equipped with the information that I need. So I left feeling that, feeling that. And so, you know, we had several breakouts and, and um, activities and things during the conference, but during one of the breakouts on the last day, they had us sit, it was a very large group. They had us sit in a circle, very large circle. And I was sitting across from a white man who apologized for the role that white people have played in this country and the oppression that they have, you know, really inflicted upon other nationalities. And I had never heard, ever heard a white person apologize for that. And I have to tell you, it brought me to tears because I told you I'm a crier. So though I don't have children, um, I still, as a black woman, I still don't feel far removed from the black women who have lost children, who have lost children to a corrupt system. I don't feel far removed from that. You know, I don't feel far removed from um, someone who has been just totally devastated by this system, even though I don't have children who have been directly impacted by it. I work with children, I work with parents who have children and the compassion that I'm able to show and bring to the table won't allow me to escape their experience. And so, you know, I, to this day, like I, I have a hard time watching, you know, movies that talk about and even documentaries that talk a lot about our experience in this country because sometimes it's just too much. It's too much to see it in the form of entertainment and it's too much to see it in real life. So to hear his apology, it just, it, it really, it did something to me. It did something to me. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that there are people who don't look like me and, and depending on who you are, who don't look like us, who, have hearts that are willing to learn, willing to assess and willing to make the necessary changes. I remember um, in 2019, um, one of our funders invited us to a garden party and I had a plus one. So I took my cousin, um, my cousin is an attorney in Wisconsin and I took her with me to this, to this garden party and you know it was beautiful, beautiful estate. Um, anything you wanted to eat, anything you wanted to drink. I mean, it was it was amazing. And Diana Ross was the performance for the evening. And so we're sitting there in the garden, waiting for her to come out, in a sea of white people. And my cousin turns to me and she says, "You got to loosen up." She said, "A lot more of them will treat a lot more of us different based on how they experience you." And at the time, what she said was so weighty that I didn't quite process it. But I did also didn't know that I would have different experiences to come that would help me to process her words. And in the processing, it is not to suggest that we don't get to be ourselves. We don't get to you know, demonstrate our heart and our passion and our compassion for one another out of fear of, of it being manipulated. It's not to say that we don't still have some of those experiences, but I took her words to me that I didn't have to be hindered by them, that I could find a way to be empowered by them, 
that I could find a way to be uplifted by him and then use that experience for the betterment of the world around me. And I would have more opportunities than a few to do just that. But even more so, being able to share that even among the group of officers and the group of young people that we worked with last summer with the Youth District Advisory Council, that a lot more of them in speaking to the young people about the officers, a lot more of them will treat a lot more of us different based on how they experience you. The same for the officers for and towards community, a lot more of them as in their fellow officers who may not share the, the same lens of social justice and community engagement, that a lot more of them may treat a lot more of us as civilians different based on how they experience them. I walked away feeling this um, inescapable accountability to how we each show up individually. That regardless of what it seems like, what it looks like, you know, whether or not um, people are being genuine with us, that has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with them. But how we show up in a space, it definitely matters. So I'm mindful of and very grateful for all of the people who quite frankly bear their cross in having hard conversations and having hard dialogues and are willing to you know, open their mouths and say something and be transparent and, and just lay it all out. You know, following George Floyd's murder, I remember having a conversation with our project leadership team within our health project. And we just talked about ways in which we could leverage this project for the sake of equ racial equity, let alone health equity or racial equity. And the voices that are at the table at, within the task force and the voices that we hear from, you know, we have a listening session coming up this Thursday to hear from community as to like, in what ways can media help to help you, you know, become more informed about different healthcare decisions you need to make. And I, I am just overwhelmed with the response that, you know, that we've received from people who are able to now have hard conversations in difficult places. And that doesn't always come because the atmosphere or the environment is like ready to have that challenging dialogue. Sometimes it comes because we're willing to be bold. We're willing to you know, be direct and we're willing to be transparent and forthright with information. And I'm, I'm, I'm really incredibly grateful. I, I know I've said how grateful I am like this entire time, but I'm so grateful that we now live in a time where we're expected to be a little more direct. You know, now whether or not we're welcomed with open arms after being bold, you know, that's, that's not up to us either. But the thing that I think is really profound about um, being direct and, and having the hard conversation is that there, is, there comes a, a, a rest even of knowing you've done what you were supposed to do and that the, the result of it is not on you. The outcome of it is not on you. You know, when I work with community partners and we work on projects and things, I'm always mindful that whatever we put in, we're gonna get out. So there's no sense in, you know, trying to make something happen the night before. You know, whatever we put into this is exactly what we're gonna get out. And so if we're mindful to the experience that we're transferring, if we're mindful to the experience that people have with us when they communicate with us, never mind what we intended, never mind what, you know, our, how pure our intentions or our motives were, never mind that, how does it land ultimately? And I think that we've come to a place where we don't always see the, imp the good impact anyway, of well-meaning people. And quite frankly, well-meaning people in all areas of life, all, all um, stages in life. And so we have to use this time to really return back to, you know, being mindful of our actions and mindful of how it impacts the world around us. Mike Gutierrez from Uptown said, his community called and he answered. During the last 12 months, he assisted with COVID-19 testing and hosted a community event where he and uh, Howard Brown Health provided over 100 fam families with free hot meals, 
They gave out 150 box food donations. They gave out 500 articles of clothing and they provided 67 flu vaccines, provided free COVID-19 screening and testing, provided blood screening, diabetes screening, dental exams, vision exams, and uh, signed people up for the census and got people to register to vote. And I, I remember when we entered our work around the census, you know, there being this need to reach hard to count communities, hard to reach communities. And the thing, that I, I, I keep like shamelessly plugging community and ethnic media outlets because hard to count communities are not so hard to count or hard to reach simply because those community and ethnic media outlets have relationship in those communities, are well regarded and very well respected in those communities. It's a matter of leveraging all of that resource in order to see the tide turn. So I've said a lot, you know, in, in this last hour, and there's a few more stories I wanna share, but it's really the, the nature of our experiences that help to make up the public narrative. And no one story is more, you know, special or more profound than the next. You know, oftentimes we see some of the same stories in news cycles, but each of us have stories to tell. Each of us have experiences to learn from. And I think the thing that, uh, one of the things anyway, that I most appreciate um, in the black community is how we lean on stories for support. And, you know, certainly for the way that, you know, our elders are sharing stories with us and, and um, the way that we're able to connect in relationship with each other through and by stories. You know, I remember having a conversation not too long ago with my father and um, it was it was shared with me a story that, you know, he, he shared with me once before. And, um, you know, you hear the, the story, you know the punchline, you know exactly like what's coming next, right? But I just remember thinking about the need to cherish that moment. And I think that we have to get to a place where we grow to appreciate each other and the presence in one another's lives because there is no promise of that presence, you know, in the days to come. So I don't want to I don't want to sound somber um, in that, but I think that there's a lot of consciousness that we have to have during this moment, and it's been how jarring the last twelve months have been that has really forced us into that consciousness. You know, a lot of times we can become desensitized by what's happening in our world and not really plug into the realities of, of of where we are and what needs to happen next. But I think the the thing that we have to really like rest in is that our stories offer a lot of power and a lot of um, experience, a lot of uh, transparency and just wisdom that we can tap into for other people. You know, I'm, I'm totally grateful for a lot of the mentors I've worked with through the years who have allowed me to tap into their stories and their experiences and their wisdom. You know, I'm conscious that they, it may have taken them 30 years to gather that wisdom that they just handed to me in 30 minutes. And so if I cherish and I process that story accordingly, that's 30 years that I already don't have to gain that wisdom, but I can build upon it. And so it's, it's necessary that we cherish one another and we own our stories. Hi, my name is Shelby. I am a recent Chicago transplant. Um, I moved here to go to grad school. Um, the last 12 months have been super up and down for me. Um, like I said, I moved across the country. Um, I've started this grad program. I've met so many amazing people virtually. Um, so those have been my highs. Um, there's also been some lows. There's been, um, you know, homesickness. There's been obviously the pandemic, um, being stuck at home, having that cabin fever, having this fear of what's going to happen. Um, so lots of highs and lows this year. I have been trying to just take it all as a learning experience. I feel like I have learned so much um, about so many different things. I've gotten involved with uh, my new school and my new community um, the best that I can. And I have just been learning so much about social justice, about racial justice, about just everything. So it's been a lot, but um, 
it's been it's been okay. <laughs> There's just been a lot, um, a lot to deal with, um, which I think is pretty common, um, a pretty common pandemic story, but it is also my story. I'm glad Shelby had a chance to share her story. We, um, you know, not only in working with the Youth District Advisory Council, but we also had a chance to work with students at Adler University on several projects, Shelby being one of them. Um, who have really helped us to, you know, explore other areas that, you know, narrative change is necessary and how, you know, we can help to advance social justice and racial equity narratives. Um, so we're very thankful for share, Shelby for sharing her experience, but even more so want to call out how, regardless of, of how old we are or what we do, you know, there is this, um, we never stop celebrating milestones. We never stop. Um, we never stop looking forward to milestones, you know. And I, I, I read something earlier this morning, and I totally agree. Like, there's a, a a woman said, you know, I didn't know that I would be this excited to age, you know. And I have to say, like, it, it's really incredible. Things that things that um, my grandmother used to say that went over my head as a kid, I totally get now. And, and it's just, it's comforting to, you know, watch yourself develop and watch yourself mature, even more so to have that experience, but to be able to, you know, connect our students with that experience as well, in the sense of like, how are you, um, you know, being challenged and changed um, in the process, you know? Um, Erica Bell shared a story with us. Uh, she says, as an African-American female who turned 50 during the pandemic and who also was born in 1970, a time when this country was experiencing great turmoil and change, I have felt for some, I have felt for some time that my civic responsibility extends beyond just voting. Voting is our reasonable service as a citizen of this great country that is yet growing up. This past 12 months, have caused me to say, like John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Those words are never more fitting than now. As a maturing adult in this country, I believe the time for our generation has come to assume a position of overwatch, to watch over, to assume the position that will help us maintain the ground we have achieved as a nation and help advance the aspirations of our founding fathers to create a just government and to, in, in, and to ensure peace and adequate national defense and a healthy free nation and that all men are created equal. All people should be and have to be treated the same way. These past four years and especially the last 12 months have shown us the demo that democracy is not free and that we must uphold democracy, not just abroad where possible, but most importantly at home. So I am, ask so I am asking myself, how can I contribute in some way to the public good and what more can I do to be a part of the solution of bringing unity and inclusion? And it's, it's so profound that, you know, we're, we're really, we're forced to think in this direction. And I think that, you know, it's been so important that we, you know, tap into that and we really look at what we can contribute to the world around us um, rather than simply just kind of sit idly by. You know, what, what civic responsibilities do we have? And I, I'm, really, um, I'm really encouraged by the stories that we've heard, the things that we've learned, where we are as a nation um, and where we're going. You know, I, when um, Vice President Kamala Harris was inaugurated that day, I just, you know, I had a hard time celebrating. And I just have to be completely honest, I had a hard time celebrating. You know, I was very, very excited for her, excited for us, but even more so looking at the year 2021 and, and this is where we are, you know, and, and the progress that we have and have not made in this time. Um, so, you know, milestones, we're constantly celebrating those, yes, but we also have to be mindful of how much further we have to go, you know, for, for as much as our forefathers, our, the pioneers of the civil rights movement, you know, for as much as they have 
um, really contributed to the world around us. You know, I'm grateful for the service professionals and the essential workers who have really stepped up during this time and really have laid their lives on the line to make sure that, you know, we have um, even a world to, to come to for that matter, you know, and I, I wanna share a story from um, another service professional who of course um, is very engaged during this time. Hi, and um, looking back at this past year, is interesting. I'm a drug and alcohol counselor and a therapist, and I had the privilege, to be honest, to work throughout this pandemic. Um, I work at a great hospital where I had plenty of PPE and good education about how to keep myself safe from the virus and a lot of flexibility to both provide good quality service to my patients while also protecting myself. Um, however, the privilege that I had of being able to go to work and not having my paycheck interrupted um, was in direct contrast to some of the things that I saw from my patients who um, lost their insurance because they lost their job because of the pandemic. And we would have to turn them away because we couldn't accept them without a way to pay. Or the individual who wanted to go to a sober living environment, but the sober living environment was closed because of of COVID and so their own progress was impacted in a negative way. And then I think about how um, my husband and my son both got COVID, but because we have good medical insurance and good care and good access to information and support, we really made it through relatively unscathed and um, how that is such a different story than so many other people have. So, this year has just been one where I think my eyes have been opened in a different way to realize what kind of privileges uh, being employed and having some stability brings um, and how quickly that can change when I uh, see what happened to clients, friends, neighbors, and the larger community. You know, I told you about um, my first therapist and I recently um, got a second therapist and well, but I'm not seeing both therapists at the same time. That's not how this is working exactly. But um, I didn't realize how normal it is to progress in therapy. Um, you know, not really coming from a background where we talked a whole lot about therapy or um, really honestly just kind of learning about therapy as an adult and the need for it and just how beneficial it is. And so this second therapist that I, that I have now um, is one that is really helping me see life totally different, you know, and helping me to see, um, I think the first therapist was more of a relational type of uh, counselor for me. Um, but the second therapist, this therapist, she's really helping me to see just how full life can be, even in the midst of trauma. And it's hard to see that, you know? And I think that's why a lot of times we have to have someone and we have to have a safe space that we can reach out to. And I remember asking my first therapist when we sat down, cause I knew what all I wanted to talk about and I knew how heavy it was. And I remember asking her if she had support cause there was no way I was gonna unleash this life on you and you don't have somebody to talk to. I don't want us to both be traumatized, you know? And so, and so um, I really grew an appreciation for support and really looking at how do you build that network, you know? And so I know that a lot of times, like we are so used to keeping our lives private. We're so used to keeping, you know, our own secrets. And I'm not saying that, you know, there's not room for candor in that, like that you can't um, hold some things closer than others. But I will say that it's important that the things that eat away at us, that we have someone in our corner to um, talk with and someone who is going to approach the situation um, to, in, in many instances on your side, not saying that they are, you know, the one to tell you that you're right or you're wrong for however you may or may not feel, but they are the one to listen to you without judgment. And they are the one to give you insight and provide, help to provide clarity, help you to arrive at clarity. And the things that I've learned about myself in therapy um, have really, and mental coaching even, have really helped to shape 
the way that I approach not only the, the uh, rigor of this work, but has really helped me to grapple with where we are as a country and how not to be overtaken by it. You know, I, I oftentimes like, you know, in talking with, with folks, I'm like, you're not watching too much news, are you? You know, watching too much of the same horrifying stories is not good. You know, you have to be able to connect with those things that, you know, are encouraging and motivating. And, you know, a lot of the stories that we see a lot of times are, are quite frankly, they're just not, you know. Um, we may get a feel good story here or there, but the types of stories that are needed are stories that will help us arrive at decisions that will help to inform us. So for all the listening that we did last year, that listening wasn't just to you know, hear people talk, it was so that we could help inform the projects that we work on, that we could help inform the agencies that we work with, um, that we can help inform you know, a lot of what we see happening across our city and ultimately across the country. And so I'm really, really inspired by you know, the work as I've shared that our interns uh, from Adler University, that our interns from the University of Chicago, I'm really inspired by the work that they're doing and what it means for, you know, really advancing equity and justice in our country. Hello, my name is Felicia and I wouldn't call myself a Chicago native because I wasn't born here nor raised here but I came here for an urban studies study abroad program and I fell in love with the dedication people from Chicago have to their city. I had the opportunity to meet, to meet nonprofit workers, community members, lawyers, and just people, you know, on the train, on the street, working towards their vision for a better Chicago. There is a vibrant feeling of justice and change in this city. So I decided to move back to Marquette Park, and I've lived here for three years. I knew that I wanted to become involved with the community, so I volunteered at nonprofits in Marquette Park, and I started working at a nonprofit Chicago public school in Englewood. This school is about a 15-minute walk away from my house, depending on how fast you're feeling that morning. So I really feel like I've immersed myself in this community of Chicago. And as a nonprofit volunteer and a Chicago public school teacher, I have seen my community transform over the last 12 months. We've become closer knit. We're engaging with one another in unforeseen ways because we've gone through this pandemic together. Within the school setting, we've revamped the education model and we've been able to provide necessities mm -hmm. for families to make remote education accessible. Within the nonprofit realm, I've seen it spark conversations between nonprofits that used to only happen in silos, and now they're happening out in the street, in the community, with different nonprofits from different neighborhoods, all in different communities where we're out speaking out. For me, this is a triumph. And one key thing that I've learned over the last 12 months is this is a time for telling stories. So thank you for asking for mine. Educators, you know, um, the role that educators are playing right here, right now, I've heard all sorts of stories about their experiences and about, you know, the expectations of educators at this moment in time. And I'm so grateful one, that educators exist and that they are passionate, you know, in, in um, teaching their students, but even more so in how they navigate a lot of these experiences. Um, and for where we are as a city, you know, I've, I've said this in, in other forums, we oftentimes are a city that is at war with itself. Um, how does how that changes, how that turns, I, I don't know. You know, I don't have the answer to that, but I, I'll tell you that the experiences that we have and the people who are passionate about leading in hard situations, I think that they, for the most part, are our are, are, are trailblazers in helping us to navigate, you know, and, and seeing things different. So I don't want to suggest that everyone has that desire or ha even has that willingness. But I think that if you have that within you, I hate to 
almost hate to put this challenge out there, but you kind of owe it to the world around you to tap into it. You know, I've, I've really had the opportunity. I've talked a little bit about the team. I talked about the directors. You know, I've had the opportunity to connect with each of them in very unique ways. And the ways in which, you know, we've learned each other, the ways in which we've connected through the years have really been profound. And it did not, but those connections did not come without seeing them as gifts and they too honoring the gift within me. And having that mutual respect and that mutual um, interest for connection is really what is allowing public narrative to, you know, pivot in this direction. I had someone say um, around September or so, like you are the queen of the pivot, you know, in being able to take every experience that you're handed and leverage it and work it and make and make something of it. I think that that offers us a full life, but then also in being able to support those people who help to do so. So we, we didn't go into great detail of all the folks doing great things around the city, but I'll say this, as you connect and you identify with folks who are doing great things across the city, look for ways to volunteer, look for ways to support their efforts, look for ways to, you know, remain connected. And, you know, it, whenever the time is right, you know, for you to help serve and help to support, by all means do so you know, but don't shy away because it's unfamiliar territory. You know, the moment could very well be now that your efforts are needed. And so I'm, I'm again, incredibly grateful for all the folks who served with me over at Public Narrative. Their service has really been a tremendous inspiration to my leadership. I'm so grateful for my peers and colleagues who serve in this space and who have remained engaged during the toughest of times I think tough times allow us to see just how tough we are and allow us to see, allows us to see what's in us. And so I, I refuse to let anything steal that optimism. Um, and in fact, even as tough situations happen, I fight for it. And I really encourage you all to fight for your optimism in whatever life hands us in, in the days to come. But certainly to, you know, I would be remiss to, to not acknowledge the lives that we've lost, uh, whether it be to violence or even to the pandemic. And I really, um, my heart really goes out to the families who are yet grieving and yet mourning loved ones that they have had to say goodbye to, be it close or from afar. You know, um, I, I can't imagine. And, and, I really and truly hope that those of us who have positions of power and positions of authority, that we find ways to utilize that authority for advancing racial and equity, racial justice and equity. You know, and those of us who don't yet know of the power that we have, that we would tap into that power, that we would, you know, discover that power and discover how we will use that power for the world around us. I wanna end the event with a story from Janine Franzak from Humboldt Park. And, Jan and I'm sorry, not Janine, Jenny. And Jenny says, learning to this, the last 12 months, she's learning to breathe through a pandemic. She bought a two flat, landed her dream job, building a citywide ecosystem to leverage collective ownership to make home ownership accessible to and sustainable for black and brown households so they can build generational wealth in the communities they call home. And we've heard so often about, you know, injustices as it relates to um, the housing market and, and redlining and, 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 you know, segregation across our city, you know, for, for folks to recognize what they're capable of doing in their respective roles is so important and so profound. So on that note, I will end this event and just thank you all for your time, for, for staying with us this last hour and a half to talk more about the state of the public narrative. You know, certainly these are not all the stories there are to capture. You are more than welcome to share your story with us. I'll include the link. If you go to our website at uh, publicnarrative.org 
you can click on um, events and you can find the link where you can you too can share your story. In addition to that, we talked a lot about community and ethnic media. We talked a lot about media across our city. You are more than welcome to nominate a journalist for a Studs Terkel Award. If you go to publicnarrative.org forward slash awards, you'll find the link to nominate a journalist. Um, you may find and within the uh, award tab, you may find previous journalists who have been awarded. So perhaps your favorite journalist has already received the Studs Terkel Award. In any event, I'm really excited to honor those who have, keep, who have kept us connected these last 12 months, who have kept us you know, in the know of what's going on around the world, around the city and within our communities. And I would so hope that you all will join us in the spring for the 2021 Studs Terkel Community Media Award. Thank you all so much for joining us for the State of the Public Narrative Address. And we will see you next time.